It is now time for question period. The member from Nipissing. What do you say? Yes, sir. What do you say? That's it. Uh, okay. if, if, the, if, if, the, if the member is not here, we'll stand down uh, the, 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 the lead question. That uh, the Minister of Finance is not going to be here for question period. So I, I'm seeking uh, some guidance on uh, is he coming so, so we can stand down our leads? Well, hang on. I, I've, I've indicated. I've, indica I've indicated that if, if a, uh, it's a courtesy that is offered uh, of to who or is here or not here, and that courtesy doesn't always mean that that person will or will not be here. That said, you always have the option to stand down your lead question if that person uh, needs to hear the question. One moment, please. So I will, I, I will have that stood down, and we may end up having to go through extra rotations, and I understand that, and I was going to ask that the uh, table restart the clock, and uh, once I make the indication of how uh, the member from Timmins James Bay will uh, stand on a point of order and ask me something. We're going to have a lead stand down. We're gone to get our leader, and she's not here just now. So we're going to have to go with questions three. Um, I'm, uh, excuse me. One moment, please. I'm going to look to the House leaders for a nod on this, and uh, if we take a five-minute recess for everyone's purposes, we'll take a five-minute recess. This House stands recessed for five minutes. It is now time for question period. The member from Nipissing. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Two years ago, your deficit was $9.2 billion. Last year, your deficit soared to $10.5 billion. Yesterday, you said you were pleased to report your deficit grew again to $10.9 billion. Minister, the only deficit target you should be pleased with is when you hit zero. You're heading the wrong way. You're getting farther away from balancing, not closer. You're now spending $29 million a day more than you're bringing in. In fact, in today's five-minute delay, you spent $105,000 more than you took in. Minister, you're failing families, you're hurting seniors, and you're putting them into an ever-deepening hole. Why should anyone believe you can balance the budget when you can't even reduce the deficit? You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. I will. Uh, I will act immediately on anyone that tries to get in heckles while I'm standing. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the member opposite has noted the challenges that before this province over the last 10 years, oh, yeah. Yeah. recognizing how tough it was in 2008 and 2009, not just in Ontario, Bruce all across Canada, order. similarly to the situation that happened with the federal government. And Ontario, Mr. Premier, has taken action by stimulating growth, and this year, Mr. Speaker, we beat our targets yet again by $1.6 billion, and we do so by moving the trajectory to balance by 2017-18, as we said we would, we're our target, 
We're achieving results. We're the lowest cost government because of the tremendous actions we've taken on Treasury Board to reduce our spending, to find the savings, to keep our fiscal house in order. While, Mr. Speaker, contrary to the opposition, we do want to yes, stimulate the economy to ensure that we grow GDP, to make sure that everyone is employed, to make sure people Thank and their families are better off. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, we realize it's April Fool's Day today, but you have to stop trying to fool the people of Ontario. Your own 2013 budget document listed the projected deficit at $10.1 billion. The fact you fluffed it up to a fake $12.5 billion forecast only to announce it came in at $10.9 billion didn't fool us, Minister. Let's go back to the secret internal cabinet documents we obtained during the gas plant scandal file. They talked about doing just what you did use a fake number for the deficit that was, quote, never a real expectation. It was a deliberate policy. Even that fake inflated number was $10.1 billion. You can't even meet your own fake number, Minister. When are you going to come clean and tell us the real state of Ontario's economy? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker. This is serious business. The member opposite is slamming the, is slamming the province. He's talking down Ontario, who have worked hard. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, Ontario has now, since the recession, has surpassed almost every jurisdiction around the world to create 500,000 net new jobs. Ontario has become the top destination in all of North America, beating out Texas, New York, California, and every other province for foreign direct investment. We're attracting investment, Mr. Speaker, and that's because they know that we have a very competitive and ensure that we have a very competitive business climate to keep our taxes low and to attract that investment. Mr. Speaker, we're creating jobs, we're stimulating growth, we're on a track to balance by 2017-18, as you said we would. Thank you. Uh, to the minister, now that we've heard the spin, Speaker, let's hear the facts. The Conference Board of Canada said you can't balance the books by 2017-18. In their report titled, How Bad Is It?, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce said, quote, Ontario's fiscal situation is becoming increasingly dire. We are likely to reach a state of crisis unless the province changes the way it does business. Moody's lowered their outlook from stable to negative. Fitch downgraded us to AA minus. Everyone but you understands there's a serious problem in Ontario. Minister, when will you finally take the advice of experts and change course? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Conference Board of Canada also states that Ontario and the government of Ontario has the most integrity of its numbers than any other government in Canada. The Conference Board of Canada also states. The Conference Board of Canada also states that Ontario is expected to lead all of Canada with growth in GDP because of the stimulus package that we put in place. RBC, TD Bank, a number of economists recognize the tremendous work that Ontarians have done that this province and this government has done to stimulate growth in order not only so that we can create greater revenue and greater wealth. But, Mr. Speaker, we are the lowest cost government in Canada because of the efforts we've taken. We have controlled our spending. We're keeping our fiscal house in order to take a balanced approach, not extreme measures that put people in harm's way or cut 100,000 people from their jobs, as the opposition has recommended, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Finance, your deficit, which grew from $9.2 billion to $10.5 billion, ballooning to $10.9 billion this year, is proof that you're not listening to the experts. You're not changing the way you do business. So, Minister, here's why all the focus on your deficit is so important. The Auditor General said 
Quote, Ontario's debt continues to grow faster than the province's economy, which could have negative implications for the province's finances. But her big I'm going to ask the member from uh, Ottawa, Orleans, and uh, Hamilton East Stony Creek to come to order. Oh, that shouldn't be interpreted as encouragement. Please finish. Thank you, Speaker. The Auditor General's biggest concern was the, quote, crowding out of other spending. We now have less money for the Question. things our citizens expect from the province. We're starting to see frontline cuts in health care and education, just as the Auditor warned. Thank you. Minister, are you too proud to admit you're wrong? Thank you. <laughs> Minister. Mr. Speaker, how about that hospital? This side of the House nice will not fall prey to being reckless when it comes to cutting and slashing and burning the very services that Ontarians depend upon. Mr. Speaker, we are also not going to be reckless in our spending. Recognize that we must maintain our house in fiscal order and hold the line. And we are because we become the lowest cost government per capita funding and spending by any by any government in comparison. Mr. Speaker, we also note this. We have also become one of the lowest tax jurisdictions anywhere in the world, beating out every U.S. state when it comes to the combined corporate income tax. We have also maintained very effective stimulus packages to encourage that investment and create those uh, those jobs that are so critical to families in Ontario. And by so doing, we take that balanced approach. It's a measured approach that we said all along that we would do. And, Mr. Speaker, we are disciplined Thank and you. determined to balance by 2017. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, we're seeing death by a thousand cuts right now, today, here in Ontario. Nurses are being cut at hospitals right across the province. We all have examples. Here are some from my hometown in North Bay. 94 full-time and 34 part-time frontline health care workers, including nurses, have been cut. More than 50 positions, including professors at Nipissing University, have been cut. 43 workers from Ontario Northland have been cut. Will you admit, Minister, that your wasteful, scandalous and mismanaged spending is Order. reducing services, hurting Ontario? Please carry on. Will you admit that your wasteful, scandalous, and mismanaged spending is reducing services, hurting Ontario's children, and putting the most vulnerable at risk. Thank you. Do you see the case? Do you see the case? Thank you. Minister? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'll admit that the member opposite is confused. Because he is, I don't the term, sucking and blowing, Mr. Speaker. On the one hand, he's suggesting that we make cuts. He's suggesting go across the board and find greater savings and put people in harm's way, just as he ran in a platform to cut 100,000 jobs from Ontarians. Now he's saying, wait a minute, you're cutting too much. Mr. Speaker, we're not doing that at all. We're taking a balanced approach. We're transforming the way government does business. The President of the Treasury Board is going line by line to ensure that everything we do is creating greater value for Ontarians, ensuring that we hold the line on our spending. And, Mr. Speaker, what they are not doing is stimulating the economy. They're not supporting transit and investment and infrastructure that enables us to do better. Answer. And that is exactly what this budget is going to be all about. And, Mr. Speaker, it is enabling us to succeed and to surpass other provinces. Thank you. Final supplementary. Minister, on your watch, seniors and our most vulnerable have seen their hydro rates triple to the point they need to decide whether it's food or warmth. But that wasn't enough for you. Your thirst to find even more money to feed your spending addiction seems to have no bounds. You cut cataract surgeries. You cut diabetes testing strips. You cut physiotherapy for seniors. This is exactly the crowding out the Auditor General 
told you what happened if you didn't drastically change course. A $10.9 billion deficit built on self-interest is not a cause for celebration. It's a legacy of disgrace, and you should be ashamed of it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontario was hit very hard during that recession. In fact, we hit the, we were hit the, the first and the hardest, and we stayed the course and we held our ground. And Ontarians stood tall, stood strong to continue to reinvest in enabling us to not feel the shock of the recession as deeply and as long as other places around the world. He referenced some recommendations by Don Drummond. Not only have we surpassed all the work that was being recommended. We have now even made even greater strides to ensure that we sustain even more savings going forward. And Mr. Speaker, what, that, what the opposition are not talking about is investing in our people, investing in education and our skills and training, investing in infrastructure and transit that enables us to provide for more jobs, and Mr. Speaker, maintaining a very competitive and yes, dynamic sir. business climate so that we can create more jobs in our province. And Mr. Thank Speaker, you. that's what we are doing. Thank you. Good question. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Uh, can the Deputy Premier tell me what page of the Liberal platform Ontarians can find the Liberal plan to sell off Hydro One and local electricity utilities? Deputy Premier. Okay. Well, Speaker, I, I think the uh, the member opposite knows full well that in our uh, in our budget that they refused, that they rejected not once, not twice, the most progressive budget in living memory, Speaker. We asset review because we are committed to build the infrastructure that this province thank you finish please we are committed to build the infrastructure that the people of this province are demanding of this government we need more investments in transit. We need more investments in transportation. We need more investments in the vital infrastructure that people depend on, Speaker. We have to pay for that, Speaker, and that's why we're looking at our assets to see how we can recycle those assets Answer. to build the infrastructure of tomorrow. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I know it's April Fool's Day, but most Ontarians have realized that budget's anything but progressive. Uh, Nick from Frampton uh, wrote to the Premier Speaker, and he was good enough to actually copy my let uh, copy my office on his Minister of Economic Development. Premier. And this is what Nick said: "Quote: At no time did you ever state during your election campaign to the voting public that your platform included selling any valuable assets owned by the taxpayers of Ontario." End quote. So, what does the Deputy Premier have to say to people like Nick? Premier, I mean, Deputy Speaker, I would expect that the leader of the third party would have read the budget, and I can refer you to page 20 of the budget. Let me read this to you. The government will look at maximizing and unlocking value from assets it currently owns, including real estate holdings, as well as crown corporations such as, wait for it, Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Speaker, on page four of the Ontario uh, Liberal Plan Assets, says our Moving Ontario Forward Plan includes a balanced and responsible approach to paying for these investments. The funds will be from dedicated sources of revenue, asset optimization, 3.15 billion or 10.9 percent. It was in the budget, and if ever we wanted evidence that the third party did not do that budget, Speaker, we have it today. Final supplementary. Been honest and said sell off instead of unlocking and optimizing, and people might have been able to get it. Uh, Lena is another person that wrote to me, Speaker, and Lena said, quote, private for-profit ownership of hydro will mean higher rates, lower dependability, and an end to public control over this vital function. And the environment. So can the Deputy Premier give people like Lena any guarantee that the Liberal 
privatization plan won't mean higher bills, less reliability, and an end to public management of an important public utility. Speaker. Well, Speaker, not only were we very, very clear in the 2014 budget that was twice rejected by the third party speaker that triggered the unnecessary election, Speaker. But the third party also integrated our fiscal assumptions into their platform. So not only did they not read our budget, they did not read their own assumptions in their own budget. She knows we have a mandate to move forward with unlocking the value of assets. We've been very clear. We are looking to unlock the value of those assets so we can invest in schools, in hospitals, in roads, in bridges, and create jobs and build that necessary transportation and transit infrastructure. So, despite what the NDP says, we ask the uh, Council to retain Answer. the government's long-term ownership of the assets' core components. We recommend keeping all three companies, Thank you. said Ed Clark. Thank you. New question. Speaker, part. my next question is also for the acting P premier. Investing in transit and transportation isn't a one-time deal. It's going to take investment year in and year out. The Liberals' answer is a one-time sell-off of Hydro One and local utilities. She'll get, they'll get a lump sum of money, but that money is going to run out, Speaker, and we'll be left paying higher hydro rates to private companies that have no accountability, no oversight, and no interest in what's good for Ontarians, Speaker. When the money runs out, we're going to be right back here, and the Premier will have to some, find something else to, to sell off. Minister of Economic Development, what second time. Long-term sustainable solutions for building and paying for infrastructure in this province, Speaker. Thank you, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the question. And listen, we we recognize how important it is for us to reinvest where we can to make even more money to the shareholders of this province, which are the people of Ontario, the taxpayers who own these crown corporations. We've also made it clear in the 2014 budget that we would look at these endeavors and these initiatives in order to maximize value to Ontario. We are not going to put our heads in the sands and pretend that there isn't something that we can do better. That's why we're making these initiatives. The member opposite also should know that we used this as a platform in our last election, which the people of Ontario endorsed. And I'll, I just want to read these three principles that we're, we abide by in this very issue. One, that the public interest remains paramount and protected. Two, that the decisions are aligned with maximizing value for Ontarians. And three, that the decision process remains transparent, professional, and independently validated. Yes, Speaker, we're working in the interests of Ontarians who own these very kind corporations. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. If the Liberals sell off Hydro One, this is going to be the result. Ontarians will pay higher hydro bills, right. and the Premier will get a big lump of cash. There's no doubt. But, Speaker, when the cash is spent, Ontarians will still be paying skyrocketing hydro bills in this province, and there won't be any money left for any other infrastructure investment. Why can't this Liberal government see the big picture when it comes to our hydro assets? Mr. Speaker, well, first off, rates in Ontario are and always will be set by the Ontario Energy Board. But secondly, we've established a trillion trust, a trust to reinvest in transit. Any proceeds that are gained from selling off land or shares of corporations that we may own that aren't providing enough support for the people of Ontario are invested into this trust, which are dedicated to transit. This is about investing in transit, investing in infrastructure to make us even more competitive. That has a greater return for Ontarians. That provides for every dollar we invest, we get $1.60 back. That's a much better return. We want to ensure that we protect the interests of the public, and it's an ongoing benefit. What we will not do, Mr. Speaker, Answer. is sell off something that happened by, with a 407, recognizing that we lost an annuity there. That is exactly what we're not going to do. We're going to Thank make you. every effort to ensure that we reinvest the benefits. Thank you. Final supplementary. One makes money each and every year. We can leverage public control to manage hydro rates. We can help with climate change, strengthen manufacturing, and create jobs. Robust, reliable, 
profitable public hydro actually helps fund investment in public transit and transportation annually in this province because it puts money annually into the public coffers. Will the Liberal government finally abandon this ridiculous scheme to sell off our hydro utility and Hydro One? Mr. Speaker, we can always do better with respect to our Crown corporations. We know that there are a number of dividends that we receive and we want to protect them. In fact, we want to enhance them and provide for greater return and greater value for money in regards to them. That's what we're doing here, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite doesn't seem to feel it's necessary to invest in transit in respect to ensuring that we become more competitive with roads and bridges and infrastructure across this province. She feels that we don't have to do that by way of looking at ways we can repurpose or revalue some of our, our assets to maximize that opportunity. They would rather we not do anything. And that, Mr. Speaker, is not an answer to the problem. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my uh, question is for the Attorney General. I think we can all agree that rising municipal insurance premiums must be reined in. In fact, we did all agree to that. Last February, I introduced a private member's resolution to implement a comprehensive, long-term solution to reform joint and several liability for municipalities. My motion received unanimous consent from all parties in this legislature. Minister, a year ago, your government agreed this was a serious issue and it, that it must be addressed. That's why municipalities were so shocked when you told last year's AMO comments you wouldn't do anything about it. Municipalities want to know, why did you change your mind and why won't you help them? Thank you, Attorney General. Merci, Monsieur le Président, and I want to thank the member uh, for his uh, question. Uh, legal liability reform is an important and complex issue that si significantly affects a diverse group of stakeholders in Ontario. So the Law Commission of, uh, in Ontario, other provinces and other countries have examined this issue and determined that the rule of joint and several liability is the fairest way of dealing <coughs> with a shortfall in damage. So after considering the feedback we receive from all stakeholders, from all stakeholders. Ontario has decided not to move forward with changes to the rule and join in several liability at this time. So, Mr. Speaker, we have looked at it, we have consulted uh, with, uh, with uh, many stakeholders, Thanks, and sir. this uh, join in uh, several liability process has been in place for Thank you. almost 100 years, and it will continue to. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Attorney General. Speaker, for, this, for years, this government has been promising action. I've seen the Attorney General's files. They show you, you sought, sought advice from trial lawyers. They show you saw, that you sought no advice from insurers, municipalities, or taxpayers. At the recent Roma Ogre conference, I spoke with many municipal officials. Overwhelmingly, they are furious. It's time to respect the will of municipalities across Ontario and respect the resolution that was passed in this House by all parties last year. Will you do it? And will you support the resolution I tabled two months ago? I'll say, I'll say that to the member uh, of the opposition. If your son has an accident and he's totally disabled, you know, I will not be able to look in his eyes and say, your dad and I, when it was possible to do so, we changed the, uh, the rules and now you have to rely on welfare for your benefits. I wouldn't be able to do that. And that's why after the consultation, we have decided that we will continue with this joint and several liability. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to Deputy Premier. Premier, can you confirm if the Premier's legal team has been in discussion with the legal teams for either Pat Sabera or Mr. So or Mr. Lougheed in order to coordinate their defence? Well, Speaker, um, we're delighted that uh, the member from Sudbury has, uh, has joined our caucus. He is a very, very fine member, Speaker. And 
the member from Timmins James Bay knows full well that uh, we're taking this seriously, uh, that the Premier is cooperating completely with the investigation. Uh, and he also knows that there, this investigation is taking place outside this legislature by people who are competent and qualified to uh, perform such an investigation. Well, definitely no answer, just more rhetoric on the part of the government, so I'll ask it again. Is the Premier's legal team in discussion with the legal team from both Mr. Lougheed and Mrs. Sabera when it comes to coordinating their defence in regards to the bribery allocation? Yes or no? Speaker, as I said, um, I said earlier, there's an investigation taking place. The Premier and uh, uh, all of us are co cooperating fully with that investigation. When asked, Speaker, uh, that investigation is taking place outside this legislature, which is where it should be taking place. Thank you. Your question, the member from Halton. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. In my riding of Halton, a number of organizations have advocated for better income supports, including increases to the minimum wage, tax relief for low-income earners, and better protections for workers across Ontario. Groups like Poverty Free Halton, Community Development Halton, and the Halton Poverty Roundtable have all asked for stronger supports for workers. In my community, workers were pleased when the minimum wage was increased to $11 an hour last June. But Speaker, we have all seen what inflation does to the cost of living. Minimum wage workers are particularly hard hit by the soaring costs of goods in Ontario. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you please explain how our government is addressing this issue for minimum wage earners in the retail, food service and other sectors in my riding? Question. Thank you. Minister Blake. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member from Halton for the question. As you will know, last summer our government brought in the eighth increase to the minimum wage wow. since we were first elected in 2003. Those of you in the House will remember in 2003, when we took over from the party across, working for an hour at the minimum wage uh, in Ontario earned you $6.85, even less if you were a student speaker. We've come a long way. Last spring, we announced that the, uh, the minimum wage would increase from $10.25 to $11. We, had, we introduced legislation that would tie further increases to the minimum wage to those same increases we see in consumer price index. Speaker, that legislation died on the order paper when the party across triggered the election we had last spring. Through the leadership of our Premier, though, Speaker, we brought that legislation back last fall and we've been able to pass it. This follows through on our commitment to annual, to tie annual increase, Speaker, to, um, the minimum wage to the rate of inflation. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be a member of a party that is standing up for the hard-working minimum wage earners across our province. The minister is correct. We have come a long way, from $6.85 an hour to $11 per hour, and soon $11.25 an hour. But some are advocating for an even higher minimum wage. But some small business owners in Halton have concerns that rising minimum wages might result in slow growth or even job cuts. With global economic uncertainty and the evolving nature of our economy, the way forward must be carefully considered. We must balance the needs of businesses while ensuring our minimum wage earners keep up with the rising cost of living. Speaker, can the minister please explain how he plans to reach Question. this balance? Thank you, Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the supplementary. Speaker, all hardworking Ontarians need to know that the income they have will keep up with the cost of living. Part of the reason we tied annual increases in the minimum wage to the CPI was to take the politics out of the decision. Another reason was to ensure that businesses in this province have a predictable and a fair way to plan for the annual increase. Each year, the government announces the new minimum wage before April 1st, businesses then have six months to prepare for that increase, and it comes into effect October the 1st. This new process, Speaker, that we have in place was part of the recommendations of the Minimum Wage Advisory Panel. It advised the government on the best approach to take. We heard from experts, Speaker. We heard from workers. We heard from businesses. They want stable and predictable increases to the minimum wage. I'm proud to say that on this side of the House, we're bringing forward the ninth increase to the minimum wage since we took office, and that families, families and businesses in this province now have Thank the you, time sir. to adequately prepare for it, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, the member from Wellington, Halton Hills.
Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development. Why is the minister reneging on his government's commitment to the Rouge National Urban Park and putting the whole thing at risk by playing petty partisan political games? Mr. Speaker, this member may not realize it, but he's speaking to a member who's dedicated the last 30 years of his life to preserving this park. It is in my own backyard as a member from Scarborough. Uh, it's something I've worked on since I was a young lad working in these halls as an assistant. So for you to question my commitment to this park is absolutely ridiculous. And for you, Mr. for the member to question this government's commitment to this park, this was the government, Mr. Speaker, under David Peterson that saved the Rouge Park. Mr. Speaker, this is the only government right now that's standing up to make sure that the current protections we have in place are maintained, which is part of the agreement the federal government made. We will not, Mr. Speaker, sell out our commitment to that next generation to ensure that the park is there for them to enjoy. Even if you want us Answer. to do that, we're not going to. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, more than two years ago, Ontario signed an agreement to transfer land to the federal government to help create the Rouge National Urban Park in Scarborough. However, the minister recently decided to go back on his word and derail the entire process for no good reason. He even has the gall to use it for Liberal fundraising. The Globe and Mail recently said this, Ontario's justification Order. for pulling out of the deal doesn't hold up to scrutiny. The Globe went on to say that he's playing games and it appears that the interests of his government don't include letting the federal Conservatives announce a new national park in the GTA during this election cycle. When will the minister keep his word and stop holding up the Rouge National Urban Park? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. I, uh, I gave some... I gave some people a warning about me standing and they're continuing to heckle. Answer, please. This government remains absolutely committed to a federal national park at some point in time when the federal government is willing to live up to their, uh, their agreement, Mr. Speaker, their part of that agreement. They were supposed to, Mr. Speaker, put forward legislation that was equal to greater to the to protections order. that we currently have in Ontario today. I have a legal document, Mr. Speaker, that, that verifies that that is simply not the case. And I've had legal representation take a look at that just to verify to ensure that our, our position is credible. And Mr. Speaker, our position is absolutely and credible. The, the current federal legislation is much weaker than the, than the protections that that land has now. You're asking us to pass on that land to weaker federal protections. We're not going to do it, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to do it. Mr. Speaker, the federal government ought to work with us to put in place the proper protections for these lands. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Same holds true on this side. New question. Member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Uh, speaker, today Londoners learned that double salary deals in lieu of leave for senior university executives are not new in the sector. In fact, the President of Western University received an earlier double payout in 2009 when he was at the University of Waterloo. Acting Premier, when you became aware of the double payout in 2009, why did your government do nothing to prevent these kinds of deals that result in million-dollar salaries from being negotiated by university boards of governors? Speaker, we passed Bill 8. We introduced Bill 8 prior to the election. Speaker, We would have passed it sooner had an unnecessary election not been triggered. When we reintroduced the legislation, the NDP voted against the legislation that would give us 
the opportunity to control executive compensation. Order. Speaker. So we Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. There is a problem with executive Second compensation time. in the broader public sector. That's why we introduced Bill 8. That is why we are moving forward to develop the frameworks for appropriate executive compensation. So, Speaker, they're just a little bit late to this party. Why they voted against the legislation that will give us the right to actually control executive compensation in the broader public sector Answer. makes their accusations a little bit hollow. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On Monday, the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities said that the public has a right to know that tax dollars are being spent properly. But on Tuesday, he said that universities are autonomous institutions and can make their own hiring and contract decisions. Acting Premier, Ontario students are facing the highest tuition rates in Canada, increasing class sizes, and more classes taught by contract faculty than ever before. How can the public be assured? that taxpayer dollars are being spent appropriately when university boards of governors are allowed to write double salary clauses into the contracts of senior university executives. So, speaker, let me repeat. Bill 8 gave the government the ability to actually control broader public sector executive compensation. That is a good piece of legislation. This House passed it without the support of the NDP. So how they can stand up now and criticize us for not taking action, Speaker, when they voted against the very action that they're demanding now is just beyond me, Speaker. So we are on this. We are addressing this issue, Speaker, because we do believe that the taxpayers of this province, the citizens of this province, should know why people are paid what they are paid, and those are the answers that we are developing right now as we speak, Speaker. Thank you. No questions. The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, Ontario's forestry industry contributes about $11 billion to our economy and supports about 200,000 direct and indirect jobs. This includes cherry forest products in Puzzlent, Ontario, very near my riding of Cambridge, which employs over 100 workers. In 2013, Ontario exported $4.9 billion in forestry products. Forestry operations can only realize full economic potential when there's synergy between operations. Sawmill operators rely on selling their residuals in order to maintain their economic viability. Therefore, it's imperative that Ontario finds innovative ways to put wood waste to work. One potential Question. use of wood waste is biomass energy. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, what is our government doing to support innovative uses such as biomass for forestry Thank resources? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, thank you very much, and I want to thank the, uh, the member for the question. There are, in fact, some very encouraging signs in the forestry industry right now. We are seeing uh, a number of new sawmills opening on a regular basis. We are now harvesting upwards of 14 million cubic meters of wood. In the depth of the recession in forestry, we're down to about 8 million cubic meters. And in fact, a new industry in northern Ontario called biomass pellet production has just begun. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Atacokan with my colleague, Minister of Northern Development and Mines, and with the support of $4 million from the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, we have seen two biomass pellet production facilities open, one in Wawa, one in Atacokan. Speaker, it's good news for the forest industry. It will help them ride through the cyclical ups and downs that we have traditionally seen in the industry. It's new, it's creating more jobs, and it's another good piece of what we're seeing happening in forestry, yes, a piece of the industry, Speaker, that did not use to exist until these two operations just got started, so we're very proud of this piece Good in news. Northern Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister not only for the answer but for his commitment to supporting Ontario's forestry sector. Maintaining a market for forestry residuals is a key part of supporting the economic viability of mills throughout Ontario, and I know that this investment will go a long way in supporting this very important sector. By increasing our use of biomass energy, Ontario can reduce our use of fossil fuels and reduce our carbon footprint. Unlike oil, gas or coal, which emit carbon absorbed from the environment thousands of years ago, there's no additional carbon released from the combustion of biomass. It emits the same carbon that it absorbed just a few months or years ago. In fact, 
2 million tonnes of wood pellets could produce 3.4 billion kilowatt-hours of electricity per Portion. year. This is sufficient to power about 285,000 homes in Ontario. Speaker, again through you to the minister, what is our government Thank doing you. to put the wood waste to work and support biomass? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, in, in 2003, all political parties made a commitment to close coal in the, in the province of Ontario. We have followed through on that commitment, and I know our Minister of Environment and Climate Change is very happy that we have actually begun to do that. Speaker, my point is that that policy of closing coal in Ontario has led directly to the conversion of two of those old coal plants, one in Thunder Bay and one in Atacokan. Now, Speaker, that conversion of those coal plants has indirectly, I would say, or if not directly led to the spawning of this new industry here in the province of Ontario. In the Atacokan context, the Rentec facility that is located in Atacokan now has a contract for years out to supply biomass pellets to the Atacokan generating station. So what we now have is a piece where we've gotten out of coal, we've created a new industry in the province, it's green, it's sustainable, it Answer. has engaged First Nations, and it's a long-term new approach to pro providing forestry in the province of Ontario. Thank you. It's a good piece on a variety of levels. Member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Good Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, the loss of a loved one is never easy. We all know that the time period is extremely difficult for all Ontarians. The estate administration tax underwent changes this year. These changes broaden the criteria of what would be affected, shortens the amount of time that is required to comply to these new rules by 90 to 90 days, and increases the penalties by misfiling by adding jail time of two years. Why is your government making it more difficult for Ontarians implementing these changes? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Certainly, the member opposite recognizes the importance to ensure integrity in our revenues, ensuring that everyone pays their appropriate share and their fair share. And that's all this is about, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're asking people to comply with what's uh, the law and nothing more. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Speaker, Minister, what you're asking people to do within a 90-day time period, which may be impossible for some to actually get the documents, if they don't do so, they're going to jail. That's ridiculous, Minister. We on this side of the House hope your government isn't trying to find new ways to find new ways to tax people after they die. Are you scrambling to cover your government's financial mismanagement? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, you know, the member opposite wants us to ensure we manage appropriately the revenues, the expenses, to ensure that everything is running effectively, to look at the underground economy, to ensure everybody pays their fair share. And we recognize families struggle in those times, Mr. Speaker, and they prepare ahead of time. There's a lot of lawyers involved. There's trust funds. There's estates. There's a number of mechanisms that are being used, which actually uh, preclude certain things to be done appropriately. We want to make certain that everybody abides as they should. That's all this is, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite of all from that party who is asking for this to even be implemented uh, in terms of providing for all the measures necessary to balance the books. Uh, this, is not what about, this is not about balancing the books. It's about just making sure everybody yes, complies. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. This morning's report gives us only a glimpse of the Liberal Sam's fiasco. At least 57 problems. Defects identified on a weekly basis. Yes, Deputy Premier, I'm coming to you. And still and staff are still overwhelmed nearly five months after SAMS started creating chaos for social assistance recipients. Will the acting premier finally admit that the Liberals got us into the SAMS mess and still months later has no clue how to fix it? Community and social services. To the community and social services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I was certainly pleased to receive the interim report from PricewaterhouseCoopers this morning and to release it publicly. Um, this is the interim report. We're going to be studying it very carefully. Uh, we will receive a more fulsome, comprehensive report at, in its final iteration at the end of this month. And uh, I'm really pleased to see that uh, they have taken a very broad look.
look at the issues around SAMs. Uh, they're looking at planning, organizational change management, user experience, stakeholder management, and communications, and the transition to operations and governance. Some of their preliminary findings uh, certainly acknowledge uh, the problems with SAMs. Of course, we as a ministry, our project team, along with our partners, IBM, have been working literally around the clock to uh, engage uh, the staff and, uh, and make improvements within That's the right. system. And so, as uh, we look forward, we know that staff do need more support. We acknowledge that, and we will be moving forward in this regard. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Speaker. Frontline staff and families on OW and ODSP can tell this government absolutely everything that they need to know about the failures of SAMS. They can tell. They can tell the Liberals how, how SAMS has left them without money for food and rent. They can tell the Liberals how SAMS sent hundreds of private ta tax details and SIN numbers to the wrong people. In fact, they've been trying to tell the Liberals for over a year that SAMS has been a disaster waiting to happen. Speaker, will the minister table the invoices for the complete cost of a report that wouldn't be needed if the Liberals actually listened to caseworkers, social assistants? recipients from the very start. Yes, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, as I've said in this House, I do want to acknowledge and thank all our dedicated caseworkers, and I see many members here from uh, QP and OPSU, and I think they're well aware uh, that I, I mean it when I say that we want to work Member together to, Mountain. in fact, uh, make their lives a little more uh, simple in terms of this particular computer system, to make it more user-friendly, and I'm actively engaged in that uh, myself. Uh, in terms of what the report has found, of course, uh, are a number of findings. Uh, some areas for improvement will make sure that all offices are adapting the way they deliver services uh, so that they can be supported in terms of the business uh, functions in those offices. Uh, we definitely know, and we've learned, Answer. it's confirmed with this report, that we need to improve best practices, the dissemination of best practices across all Thank you. some 250 offices in this province. Thank you. Your question, the member from Ottawa South. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs. This year, we celebrate the 400 years of French presence in Ontario, and it is important to realize that there are more than 1.2 million Francophones and Francophiles in Ontario. Whether they are Franco-Ontarians uh, since 400 years or Franco-Ontarians that come from recent immigration, all Francophones in Ontario are uh, preparing for great celebrations this year. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs give, give us an overview of what the government is doing for the 400 years? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I would like to thank the, the, um, our member from Ottawa South. In June 2013, we announced that we wanted to commemorate the 400 years of Francophone presence in Ontario. In September, we, were announced, we announced in Sudbury $5.9 million to uh, help different projects. Those celebrations will mostly happen during the summer from June to October. And Mr. Speaker, Francophones and Francophiles are inviting all Ontarians to come and celebrate with us. Thank you. Thank you. Question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her answer and also for her relentless energy when it comes to Francophonie. It is very exciting to see everything that is happening in Ontario Francophonie in general, but also when it comes to the celebration of 400 years of French presence in Ontario. My question, once again, is for the Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs. Can the Minister share with us the progress that is uh, happening concerning the community celebrations that will happen uh, for the 400-year celebration? The Minister. Yes. 
the office has received many applications from many organizations and groups and municipalities. They all have a great interest in uh, celebrating the 400 years. We are now going through the applications and we will analyze them soon and we will then announce those that will receive a uh, funds for their projects. I have to say that I am looking forward to the celebrations. When it comes uh, to cultural or historical celebrations, there will be a festival uh, at uh, different parks and we will also uh, reproduce the 400 years anniversary. There is a Franco Fête in Toronto, there is another one in Ottawa. I also went to the launch of the movie on Samuel de Champlain, produced by TFO. And I will encourage all of you here to watch this film called Rêve de Champlain, produced by TFO. Thank you. Thank you very much. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Minister, uh, last April I wrote to you after meeting with uh, service clubs in my riding concerning a number of issues that are hindering their everyday operations. On February 19th, my resolution on service clubs was debated and passed unanimously with all party support in this House. And the resolution stated, the Minister of Finance should immediately move to have a standing committee investigate the legislative and regulatory barriers and burdens facing service clubs in Ontario who serve their respective communities and conduct ongoing community service, which helps alleviate, alleviate the demand for publicly funded services. So again, Minister, the resolution, as you know, received all party support. So I ask you, when are you going to strike the committee? Thank you, Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite. I welcome uh, the member's interest in discussing service clubs, certainly around Ontario and the, and the impact it has on our respective communities. I recognize and value the importance and the role that the service clubs provide our communities. The member is commended for engaging in this discussion, for, for looking at the issues that provide uh, some added challenges, many of which are municipal and federal in nature, but we would like to uh, take the opportunity to remind the member that financial audits certainly are uh, regulations that uh, he has requested to review and potentially modify them. Uh, we have to do that with respect to the federal government. And, and when it comes to HST and other things for the service clubs, um, again, it's something that we're trying to work with the federal government as well. So again, Mr. Speaker, I welcome uh, the member from I welcome Mr. Wilson's uh, 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 interest in this, and, uh, and uh, he's to be commended. And I look forward to further discussing this further in the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. I'll, uh, I'll give you a hint. Her Majesty is the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. <laughs> well, supplementary. I've been called worse. So, <laughs> as you know, and all members of the House, I think would agree, service clubs are the backbone of our communities right across the province. Their dedication to serving so many deserving causes, their sense of community and ability to bring people together, service clubs make Ontario a better place to live and to do business, here, here. while alleviating significant, a significant financial bur burden off your shoulders, Minister, and off the state's uh, shoulders, the province's shoulders, uh, in terms of the good work that they do. They often fill the gaps that government can't do and shouldn't do. And, you know, when, you got the, when we got them together, and they, we were represented from hundreds of service clubs, some individual clubs, some, uh, some of the people that filled out my survey were responding on behalf of their region. Uh, there were a number of issues Question. that were federal, and I'm dealing with the federal government on those, taking your advice. You did write me a letter suggesting that. But we need a committee provincially because yeah. many more of their issues yeah. were pr provincial matters, some of them small, some of them big, Thank but you. make their lives better so they can help other people make their lives better. Thank you. Again, Mr. Speaker, I commend the leader of the official opposition uh, of Ontario for the work uh, and, the, and, and the consensus around this Legislative Assembly to do just that. And certainly when it comes to issues in regards to uh, property tax, as you know, the not-for-profit service clubs are, are charged at a residential rate as opposed to uh, the commercial rate, and again, working with the municipalities to try to make it even more effective uh, for those service clubs that provide such a tremendous amount of workforce. When it comes to gaming and the OLG, some of the things that you've requested in respect to that, we know that working with the municipalities to look at, at uh, the charity casino opportunities for them. And Mr. Speaker, when it comes to striking a committee, I encourage all House leaders to put forward something and enable this to take place. So congratulations Thank and you. for the work you're doing.
Question. The member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the acting premier. Last week, I asked the Minister of Health to stop deep cuts to surgery in London, but he said he didn't know the specifics. A week later, it's just not surgeries, but thousands of hours of patient care that are being cut. London Health Sciences Centre is eliminating a staggering 97 full-time positions, and St. Joseph's is cutting 24 full-time jobs. The Liberals can't say they don't know about cuts to our hospitals that put patients at risk. The real question is, why doesn't the Health Minister care, and why doesn't this Liberal government care? Health, health, long -term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I do remember the question from last week uh, <laughs> with regards to the uh, elective surgery. What uh, what the member opposite didn't mention at that point in time about that two-week hiatus, which in many hospitals around the province, on a scheduled basis, there are closures of uh, surgeries of operating theatres for a variety of reasons. This was a scheduled closure for a two-week period, which occurs from time to time. And in fact, despite what the member opposite had to say last week, there were no surgeries that were cancelled. There were no Whoa. surgeries that were scheduled Whoa. that were cancelled. Uh, and this this was a measure that, that took place, uh, uh, as I mentioned, from time to time at hospitals, with the full knowledge of the Lynn as well. Uh, it didn't impact patient care. There's no negative impact in terms of ER or other services, and I'm happy to answer the other issue in the supplementary. They don't. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you to the acting premier. Hospitals across the province are laying off frontline nurses and staff because of the Liberal budget cuts. At Grant River Hospital in Kitchener, 45 layoffs notices were sent to staff. That announcement came today. That's on top of the 33 layoffs at Cambridge Memorial Hospital last month. No one believes the spin that frontline jobs in our hospitals don't hurt patients. Families know that fewer nurses and hospital staff mean one thing. Patients will wait even longer for the care that they need. When will the Liberals stop these reckless cuts to our hospitals, stop the layoffs in Kitchener and Waterloo and across the province, and stop putting patient care at risk? Thank you. And Mr. Speaker, I think the member opposite knows that layoff notices do not equal layoffs. Uh, in many cases, in fact, uh, around the province, uh, from time to time, there are shifts in programs and services. Often there are vacant positions that haven't been filled uh, previously, and those positions are removed so that services can be provided elsewhere within a hospital. Uh, in fact, when layoffs are required for certain programs, often the individuals working in those positions are, in fact, deployed as is required because of representative rights and the union representatives, the model that has been created is that that layoff is required to transfer that individual to another area of the That's hospital. Right. Uh, but the member opposite does know that we have 24,000 more nurses working in this province uh, than, than we did approximately a year ago. We have 5,000 more physicians working in the province over the same period of time. We've increased our funding to hospitals across the province by roughly 50 percent in the last decade as well, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Good question. The member from Pickering, Ajax. Ajax, Pickering. Well, my question is to the Minister of Education. I know that Ontario's public funding is recognized as one of the best in the world. I'm extremely proud of our accomplishments as our success has been based on the talent, dedication, and hard work our education community. I know that we are investing in education to ensure that our students continue to achieve excellence, and we have a lot to be proud of in terms of student achievement. Just today, both you and the Premier announced that more students are graduating than ever before. This is incredible news. Minister, can you please tell us how our government is helping students graduate with the skills they need to succeed in today's global competitive world? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ajax Pickering, although I must admit it was a little hard to hear him over here. But I do think from what I could hear that the member is absolutely correct that more students are graduating than ever before. When we came into office in 2003, only 68 percent of students were graduating from high school within five years. Today, we announced that 84 percent of students received their high school education. That's great news. That's huge. That 
it, for those of you who went quick on the math, that's a 16 percentage point increase in the graduation rate in Ontario. That Answer. means the last 163 more students. Finish, please. Wrap up. One sentence. That means that 163,000 more students have graduated than would have if we had the Thank you. grad rate. I, um, I might come to the member from Ajax Pickering on a supplementary, but uh, no, I think I will. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and you are correct both ways, Mr. Speaker, as always. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I know constituents in my riding are pleased to hear that more students than ever are graduating. I know our government continues to invest in schools, and the high graduation rate demonstrates that our government's student success strategy is working. Minister, this means that our graduation rate is now just one percentage point away from government's goal of 85 percent of students graduating. Can you please tell us what steps our government will take to ensure we reach our important goal of 85% of students graduating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Over the past 10 years, our student success strategy has provided support and resources for students and ensured all high school students have access to learning opportunities that match their future aspirations. For example, our specialist high skills major program allows 44,000 students to focus on knowledge and skills in various economic sectors. Our dual credit programs have allowed 22,000 students to earn up to four credits that counts towards both their high school diploma and a college diploma really degree or apprenticeship. We've worked very hard to make sure that Ontario students have a strength to develop their strengths, their interests, their goals during their school experience, and we will Answer. continue to ensure that students are graduating with the knowledge and skills they need Thank to you. reach their full potential. The member from Huron, Bruce, Thank on you a very point, much. Of point of order. order. Thank you. I would like to welcome Marianne and Jim Batty to Queen's Park. They made the trek to Toronto from my riding. They're good friends and neighbours of ours from the Formosa Teeswater Belmore area. Okay. Member from Nickelbelt on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I wish to correct my record. On March 26, I referred to the Hertzing Eye Institute as an independent health facility. They are not. Thank you. The uh, member from Ottawa, Orleans, on a point of order. Point of order, Monsieur le Président, me fait grand plaisir de présenter. It is a pleasure for me to introduce Marianne Martel, who is here from the Association of French-speaking Lawyers of Ontario, and she's here to present uh, uh, for the Francophone Caucus. Um, I think everyone in the legislature knows we are a hundred days away today from the official start of the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games. And I just want to make sure, though, I know every member of the House would be aware that the Pan Am Para Pan Am medals are actually here in the, uh, in the legislature today. I'm sure many have already been to see them, but for those who haven't, they are on display until 1.30 today in committee room 228. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.